God's good. So, you love Jesus? Before we get started, I just want to say again, there's a lot of things going on in our government right now. And I want to remind you that this is not a battle between socialism, democracy, Republicans, liberals, uh, Democrats, socialists, whatever. We have a battle going on right now, and the battle's between good and evil. And the kingdom of darkness is wanting to destroy God's creation. And just like in the beginning of time, uh, what God loves, the devil hates. And the devil seeks to destroy it. And he seeks to destroy it using any way he can. And throughout history, we're going to talk about one of these methods tonight, but throughout history he has tried to um, end the timeline of man. And he's done this by uh, several things that are so politically incorrect that there's some people that don't even like me because of what I say. But as long as, you know, the Bible says, as long as you say what Jesus says, you're okay. So, bottom line is, uh, God's plan was one man, one woman, because one man, one woman, one woman, one man can produce a child. And from the very beginning, God said, go forth and multiply. And you can't multiply with uh, two men, and you can't multiply with two women. And somebody may say, well, the reality is uh, they can always go out and adopt. Yeah, but they're not going, they, they're going to have to adopt. It's a product of some man and some woman somewhere. So that's one way, because, I mean, let's, let's think logically. If everybody on the earth took up the gay lifestyle, it would be our last generation. Okay, that's one way. Another way, since um, there's been many, many millions in the United States, and they estimate a billion worldwide uh, babies have been aborted. That's another way. Kill a generation before it even sees the light of day. In some states in the United States right now, you can abort a child one day before giving birth. Let me ask you something. What does a baby look like one day before it's born? And if you see uh, an actual medical room video of how they do this, you would be appalled. Well, see, this is nothing new. This is what they did in the Bible. At the Temple of Moloch and, every, and several other false temples, they sacrificed their children. God says, don't take your kids, your children through the fire like the heathens do. So, Satan's always had this plan to destroy mankind. And I think I'll just go ahead and move right into it right now. Uh, another way that he sought to uh, destroy mankind was through the destruction of the DNA of man and to cause mankind to literally be perverted physically. Now, we know that uh, in the garden, and I was just thinking about this the other day, how interesting this is. Satan was cast out of heaven. He was Lucifer, and he was cast out of heaven. And when he was cast out of heaven, uh, this was before Adam and Eve's time, and he was very beautiful. I mean, the Bible talks about how he was adorned. He was anointed. He was, he was the anointed cherub that covers. He was he was magnificent in his beauty, and he was cast down to the earth. Now, when he was cast down, uh, it was recognized at that particular time, according to Scripture, that uh, he had done wrong. And he had done wrong by cheating the kings of the earth the Bible says that the kings of the earth sneered at him when he was cast down. This is before Adam and Eve. And one of the things that they sneered at him about was because of his inequity and his trading. He was, 
he was not fair in his commerce. So the very first question that comes up always is, so you're saying that there were people before Adam and Eve. No, I am not saying there are people. There were people before Adam and Eve. I'm saying there was a civilization before Adam and Eve, but they were not men. They were not human because we are clearly told Adam was the first man. So were there men before Adam? No. Were there people, a creation, let's put it this way, a creation, yes. What do we know about them? We know that they had nations. We know that they had commerce. We know that they had kings and kingdoms, uh, a, a medium of exchange, currency, and borders. The Bible tells us that much. That's, that's not hypothetical. That's something the Bible tells us. Now, when Lucifer was cast down, he... He was cast down also because he tried to move outside of his purpose in creation. Now, I don't think that the angels knew it. Now, that's opinion. I don't have scripture on that. I, I don't think that the angels knew completely what God's plan was. And I'll tell you right now, I don't know if we know completely what God's plan is for the eternal ages. We know our portion here. But the reason I don't think that the angels knew their purpose, one is because uh, in a conversation recorded in the Bible, there was an angel who spoke to the Father and said to Lord God, who is this man? that you're mindful of him. Like, why are, you, why are you thinking so much about this man? It was an angel that was saying that. Well, obviously, the angel hadn't understood the purpose of man. And if we can follow this, we can see through the book of Hebrews that God had put everything into place for the ultimate creation which was us, man. Because he created us in his likeness and in his image and referred to us as his children. Now, the angels, according to Hebrews, had a purpose in their creation. Now that we know one of the purposes is that they were to worship God. But another purpose, and it's implied it was the main purpose, was that they were created to minister for us. The Bible says that angels were created to minister for those who will inherit salvation. That's us. So what God was doing in the creation of the universe, the creation of all the galaxies, in the creation of the earth, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was setting everything up so that he would have a place and have it all decorated for the creation that was going to be in his likeness and in his image. Much like, I will say, kind of like Loretta and the house. I've lived with Loretta for over 50 years, and I know something about her. She, first of all, she thinks like God. All right. If, if we were to build a house, and we, we've done this a few times, but if we were to build a house, my attitude is, well, let's just kind of move in and we'll finish it as we go. <laughs> I think women are this way. Loretta has the attitude of when you get it all done and everything's done and the doorbell's hooked up, the garage doors are painted and the house's numbers on the outside. 
then we will open the door and move in, and it's finished. Well, that's kind of the way God thinks. And it's never happened. But that's kind of the way God thinks, I believe. Because he was setting everything up. Angels were created to minister for man. So he created them first. He, he created the universes first. He, he created the heavens and the earth first. And, and he, he created everything so that he could place man here on this earth. But Lucifer, it says, because of the iniquity that was found in him, he decided that, in, and, and maybe he didn't know, I don't know, but he decided that instead of hanging around to see what God's purpose was, which God's purpose was eventually for him to minister for those who will inherit salvation, he decided he was going to rise up, and according to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, he was going to rise up and be like the God Most High. He didn't say he was going to be God. He never said that. He said, I'm going to be like God. And I'm going to put my throne on the sides of the north like the God Most High. Well, see, he wasn't created to be like God. We are, but not him. So he was cast down to the earth, and then it's like, and he, he, he was cast down, and I believe, this is my opinion, I believe that he was some top type of reptilian, and I believe he was beautiful. I mean, beautiful. Because when he came to Eve in the garden, Eve didn't go, ah, snake! <laughs> no, no, she, she wasn't all freaked out. They had a conversation. They talked. She may have even been flattered that such a beautiful creature talked to her. You say, well, wait a minute. He was cursed. Yeah, Lucifer was cursed, but he was cursed after Adam and Eve had sinned and God lined them all up and he told Adam this and he told Eve this and he, he cursed the serpent. And so then the serpent, that's when I believe. And this, I, I'm going to tell you what scripture and what I believe. Okay, That's when I believe Lucifer became hideous. And all the angelic beings that were fallen with him became hideous. And I can tell you this, to be true, I have, I am not one of these people that sees a demon in every doorknob, but I have at one point in time in my life, I did see a demon, physically see a demon. It took place during a church service at Walk on the Water Faith Church. Uh, there was a, a, a medical doctor on the platform, and uh, I was praying for people, and the music was playing in the background. It wasn't a wild and crazy service. I just People were coming up one at a time, and I was praying for them. And I glanced over at the doctor, the MD from Camdenton, and standing next to the, to the doctor was a slimy, what looked like a, a, a Great Dane dog, similar, but it, it was slimy. It, was, it looked like if you would have put your hand on it, it would have been goo. It was like, excuse the term, ladies, put your hands. It was like men, you'll understand. It was like snot. And it was awful. And I saw it, and it was, and it was big, long legs in front, and it was just sitting there staring at me. And I was about this far away, and I looked at it, and uh, I think the words I said, something was, I curse you in the name of Jesus, or something along that line. And... Uh, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I, I'm not sure, but one of those two. And <laughs> the doctor thought I was talking to her. Because I pointed over, you know, pastor, <laughs> pastor just rebuked me. <laughs> but I saw that thing leap off the stage, and we were across the street at Main Street Music Hall, where it happened. And the stage is about this tall. It leaped off the stage and loped all the way up the aisle to the back. Now, I've never used drugs in my life, so I don't have any LSD hangovers in my body. I've never been drunk in my life. I saw it. 
So I do know, I can tell you right now, I do know firsthand. Now, people, I've heard other people tell stories and you go, oh, oh I'm sure, you know, whatever. But if, when it happens to you, you know. Okay, so I know. And I believe the Lord allowed me to have discerning of spirits and see into the realm of the spirit at that moment. If nothing more, I'm in the ministry, folks. <laughs> and I need to know for sure demons exist. I mean, I know now, see. But I know that they're hideous. They're not beautiful. Uh, Lucifer may have been beautiful at one time, but demons are not beautiful now. So, when, they, when Lucifer was being cursed, a very interesting statement was made. You can read it in Genesis. It says... To the woman, he said, your seed, there will be enmity, war, between your seed and the seed of the serpent. And how does it go? It says, your heel will bruise his head, something along that line. So, There was a proclamation right there, basically letting us know that the seed of the woman, and if, if you read that in your, in your Bible, it'll, you'll notice the seed is capitalized. That's because almost every Bible scholar out there believes that that's referring to Jesus. Well... The devil may be ignorant and stupid in a lot of ways, but he's, he's not uh, intellectually void. And I believe he recognized at that point in time that genetically there was going to be a Messiah come along. And so at that point, he, he wanted to pervert the race of humans in such a way that there could not be a pure human born. The plan of God is that there would be a perfect sacrifice on the altar. The perfect blood of a perfect lamb slain. So that takes us over to uh, a time when People were doing evil on the earth. Let's just turn over right now to uh, Genesis. And if we could put this up on the board. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. And let's take a look at uh, verse 1. Now it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, God, that's Ben Elohim, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for them of all whom they chose. Now, let me just tell you this. The ancient book of Enoch, which is referred to several times in the Bible, in chapter 6 of the ancient book of Enoch, verses 1 and 2, are almost word for word identical to Genesis 6, verses, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. We could talk on that for an hour, but we won't. Verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Verse 5. Then the Lord saw 
that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. Verse 6. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, we need to understand that Noah, can anybody tell me who Noah was? He built something. What did he build? The ark, okay. So there was a time when he built the ark. Was it before this or after this? After. So before he built the ark, there was evil on the earth. And before he built the ark, there were sons of God Almost every commentary, Loretta has a lot of ancient Jewish commentaries. And today, uh, I stuck my nose in a few of those, and they almost all, there's one that disagrees, but they almost all say, and some of these commentaries were written in ancient times, all the way back near the time of Moses. And they have written them and copied them, and the And these fragments even of these have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they all agree basically on this. That there were angels, watchers, the book of Enoch talks about this quite extensively, who, and some even give a number, say 200 of them, they came to the earth and they were the Nephilim. Now, Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word nephal, which simply means this, fallen ones. The word nephilim means fallen ones. And you're going to find variations of this. And (laughs) today I was reading what a semi-well-known minister wrote about this, and If you don't read your Bible, his story sounds pretty good. But if you read your Bible, the Bible can't be true in his story. Because he believed that the giants on the earth were just kind of like tall people. Well, they weren't just tall people. If the Bible is true, how many of you believe the Bible is true? Now, this is what we got to put the foundation on. If the Bible is true, then these giants in the Bible, some of them ranged even up into the 30 to 36 foot range. And that sounds ridiculous and impossible, but that's only because it hasn't been taught. So let's just see Uh, There's no way we can cover all this tonight, but let's just see what the Bible has to say about giants, okay? Now, um, let's take a look at Numbers 13, 13. And I want to answer a question that you, you haven't asked, but everybody does. And that is this. Uh, God's a good God. That's what you say, Pastor Larry, God's a good God. So you just tell me why this good God told King David and some other people, Moses, that you go into this village and you wipe out every man, woman, child, infant, pregnant woman. You kill them all. You don't leave a one. Oh, that's evil. That's not a good God. Do you deny that God said this? Well, here's my answer. No, I don't deny that God said this at all. But what you don't understand is these civilizations that they were supposed to wipe out were not human. They were hybrids. 
Now, see, for example, they talk about um, in Numbers 13, let's go to Numbers 13.33. Let's go to verse 33. Sorry. It says, there we saw giants. There we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. So this doesn't mean that there was just accidentally one giant person. No, no, there was giants, plural. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. Now, do you remember at Kadesh Barnea that there was all these spies sent out? How many? Twelve. Twelve spies sent out. Two of them came back. Joshua and Caleb said, hey, we can go in there. We can take this place. And you know why? how I know we can take this place? Because God said we can take this place, and we're going to go in and we're going to take the land. And the other ten spies came back and said, oh, you've got to be kidding me. There's giants in that land. Now, <clears throat> I've heard people's ministers preach on this, and they go like, well, they were, they were just scared because, you know, they didn't want to fight, and... You know, the people living in that land were just big people. No, they were giants. Now, when it comes to the size of the giants, it varies a little bit because they measure a cubit different in different Eastern cultures. But the way the Jews measure a cubit, we can get pretty close. And most of the giants in the Bible were probably somewhere between 9 and 13 feet. 9 and 13 feet. The ones that were around the time of Moses and Joshua and Caleb. There were some who were larger. Uh, for example, uh, let's see. Let's take a look at a scripture here. I pulled out earlier. I thought it was kind of interesting. If I can find it. I'm kind of like Loretta tonight. I've got so many notes that there's no way I can get through them all. Uh, let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. When I was a kid, I couldn't say Deuteronomy. I kept saying Deuteronomy, and I just couldn't get it right. And you really don't care, do you, at all? Okay. So, <laughs> then we turned and went up the road to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us. He and all his people, all right, to battle at Edrai. Next verse. And the Lord said to me, now that's yud Hey vav Hey. Remember, every time you have a capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's the name of God Almighty. That's yud heh vav -He. And the Lord said to me, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him and all his people and his land into your hand. And you shall not do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon. Next. Huh? Did I say not? Go back to that verse. Did I say not? Go back to verse 2, if we could. I don't know if this goes... And you shall... Did I say not? You shall do to him as you did. Okay. Next, verse 3. Thank you, Loretta. So the Lord our God also delivered into our hands Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, and we attacked him until he had no survivors remaining. All right? So they attacked. Who's dead? Everybody but the king. Verse 4. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we did not take from them. Sixty cities. You see that? Sixty cities. We're not talking about twelve giants living in a tent. Sixty cities. All the region of, boy, what a bunch of names, 
Argob, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. Verse 4, verse 5 now. All these cities were fortified with high walls, gates, and bars beside a great many rural towns. Verse 6. And we utterly destroyed them as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon. Utterly destroying, destroying who? The men, women, and children of every city. But all the livestock and the spoil of the cities we took as booty for ourselves. Verse 8. And at that time we took the land from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were on the side of the Jordan from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon. The city... How do you say that, Loretta? The Sidonians call Hermon Siron, and the Amorites call it Sinir. Verse 10. All the cities of the plain, all Gilead, and all Bashan, as far as Salca. Now you know why they don't preach on this. Okay. And Edri, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. Verse 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant. Here's what I want you to see. They, they defeated 60 cities. They killed all the men, women, and children. And it doesn't say he was the only giant. He's the only one that remained of the giants. He was the only... Remain, he was for only Og, king of Bashan remained of the remnant of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. It is not in Rabbah of the people of Ammon. Non. Nine cubits is its length. Now, one of the Jewish historians, and I believe <coughs> also Josephus, uh, I've got the works of Josephus in my office. They are very interesting. If you ever get a chance to pick up a book on that, I, I don't know if we have it in our bookstore or not, but if we don't, we should. But he was a Jewish historian at the time of Jesus, and he, he has a lot of Jewish history. Uh, but at any rate, I believe it's him who says that they still had this bed in kind of like a museum. Og, the king of Bashan, they still they kept his bed. Why did they keep his bed? Because nine cubits is its length and four cubits is its width according to the standard cubit. Now, depending on how you measure it, that bed was anywhere from 15 to 18 foot long and approximately three to four foot wide. And, the, and one of the writings is, and the king filled it. So if he filled that bed, you've got to understand that his kneecap would probably be about, I'm six foot four, his kneecap would probably be about where my forehead is or something. Maybe even a little higher. Now, here's the thing. This is information that you don't have to know in order to get saved or to get somebody saved. But I am just a little weird in this. If it's in the Bible, God wants me to know it. And I think he wants us to know it because he wants us to know more than just get saved, don't sin, and live forever. He, he wants us to know more about him. He wants... To a degree, he wants to know what he's gone through to get us the salvation that we have. And this perverted DNA, I believe, is what the devil wanted to do. He wanted to pervert all the DNA, DNA on the earth, and then there would not be a perfect bloodline for the Messiah to be born into. So he destroyed all flesh on the earth except Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their sons, and their sons' wives. Now, the Bible does not clearly tell us 
how giants ended up on the earth after the flood. But we do know that they were. Because we have Goliath that was killed by David. And his brothers, Goliath's brothers, one of them who had six, the Bible says he had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. He couldn't buy gloves at a regular store. But the Bible says they were the descendants. Now we're talking about after the flood. They were de the descendants of the fallen ones of the Nephilim. So how could that be? Well, there's theories. I will give you my theory. Um, I believe that Noah and his wife were perfect in their genetics. The Bible even says that Noah and his wife were perfect in their flesh. And that word there, I looked it up, and it means their flesh, their body, their makeup of their body was perfect. So they did not have fallen angel DNA in their system. Well, they had three sons. Well, of course, if they were perfect, their three sons would be perfect, right? I mean, that stands to reason. Because their three sons are from two perfect people. And, but their three sons had wives. And Ham, have you ever wondered why the Jews don't eat ham? Okay, <laughs> Ham, Ham was one of the sons. My opinion, opinion, is that Ham's wife still had some genetics from the Nephilim in her system. I partially get that because when Ham sinned and his, his son was named Cain, none, when, his, when, his, when, when there was sin in his part of the family, it wasn't Ham that was cursed. It was his son that was cursed, Noah's grandson in that line. So the person who was cursed was not the person who had genetics. Bottom line is, we know that the giants after the flood were smaller than the giants before the flood, and that as time went along, they were wiped out. Even like Og, the king of Bashan. What did the Bible tell us? There were 60 cities. God said, you go in and you take them out. Everybody. I mean, they kept the animals. Why did they keep the animals? Well, the animals weren't affected. But you go in and you wipe out every man, woman, and child. And when you get right down to it, the only one that was left was the king. So, I have got page after page of scriptures in the Bible that talk about the giants. But what I'd like to do is show you in the remaining few moments we have left some pictures of where I was last week. And um, so could we turn the house lights down just a little bit more so that they could see the screen up here just a little easier? And even if they can't see me on the video, that's okay. Okay, Angie, I just gave these to her in a random order, and we're, I'm just going to kind of give you some commentary on these as we go here. <clears throat> Literally, uh, the United Nations has taken over some of these, what they call ancient temples. Now, they're, they're not temples like they're inside, but they're temples that used to be freestanding outside, and they were covered, the roofs were rock, were stone. And these stones, some of them weigh, like that stone right there is probably 20, 30 tons. They're huge. Uh, virtually impossible for a normal person to move. But they, they call these uh, Gagentua, the, the temple of the giants. And that's been handed down from generation to generation to generation. Uh, some of these places, they wondered what they did with them. To me, they look like chairs. Now, this place right here, for example, uh, the United Nations will not allow you to film or, or do any video of any kind. We didn't know that while we were flying our drone. <clears throat> but my friend, uh, L.A. Marzulli, who was with us, uh, some of you have seen him um, 
on uh, Ancient Aliens on the History Channel doing commentary, but uh, he was with Robbie and I for the, for the week, and along with uh, Bob Ulrich from Prophecy Watchers, and you can see these markings in these stones, <clears throat> and Marzuli, L.A. Marzuli, had just gotten back from Peru and researching the DNA. He's the guy that wrote the book on the DNA of the elongated skulls. And these are the exact same markings that they have in Peru on the stone. Now, somebody may say, well, the stones are similar. The markings are the same. So how can you have markings in the Mediterranean and markings in Peru and the same markings in the outback of Australia literally tens of thousands, you know, thousands of miles apart made by civilizations that couldn't travel any faster than an animal separated by thousands of miles of water. Well, you just got to think about it. Next, let's go to another slide. Um, these, they used to wonder what it was that they stored under those stones. Those stones are huge. Um, but the more you look at these, the more you begin to realize some of these look like chairs. And we went to several different uh, temples. We even took a, a ferry and went over to another island called Gozo, which has 20 temples on it, and only two of them were available for us to get into. And we talked to a local guy, and we got into a giant. They have a place called the Giant Cemetery. And um, it, it's, it's amazing how these stones weighing, some of them possibly even hundreds of tons, they, they, how they said they were moved. Uh, the guy at the United Nations said, well, the way they did it is they had stones, and they had these stones that they found about this big around. He says, they put these stones, they query these things a few miles away, and they, they, they take the, you know, the 20, 30 ton slab that is hewn down perfect, and they put it on these stones, and then they roll it to this location. And I said, I said you got to be kidding. You put that slab on those stones, they're just going to sink into the ground. And besides going up and down the hills, are you serious? Later, on the last day as we were leaving, they pulled us aside and they said, we haven't changed any of the signs yet, but we no longer believe that they could have been moved with those stones. <laughs> because they discovered that those stones that they claimed that they were being rolled on were made out of a softer limestone. And they would have not only been pushed into the ground, they would have crumbled. Next slide. This is uh, the hypergeum. We went down into the hypergeum. In 1910, there was a guy who was uh, making a cistern under a house in Malta, and he cut into the stone so they could collect rainwater and store it under the house. And he cut into a stone, and I saw it, the place where it was. It's about this big. He cut the stone, and he was going to lift the stone out. And when he went to lift the stone out, his Equipment slipped, and the stone went down into a hole. And so they looked down into the hole, and what they found down in this hole was a palace, a castle, basically, cut out of solid rock underground, and so far they have pulled out over 30,000 skeletons. This thing has got, it's got an amphitheater, it's got a king's chamber, and there are tunnels that they have blocked off, but some of these tunnels, they believe, go all the way under the Mediterranean to Rome. Now, ancient peoples who have no engineering ability, hello, give me a break. Um, that was in 1910 that they discovered this. I believe it was 1941, National Geographic, and we have the magazine. National Geographic did an article about a school teacher who took her elementary class down into the hypergeum to show them the, the palace underground. They got lost. They never, ever found them. Ever to this day. A whole class of students went down and disappeared. So we went down into this. It's, it's amazing how they made this 
underground out of solid rock, found by accident. Who knows how many more there are. Next slide. Uh, this will kind of give you an idea of uh, all the way to the left. See the itty-bitty little guy over there? That's six foot. Now, people think in terms of, well, you know, uh, Goliath, he, he could have been, some people say he could have been as short as 12 foot. That's not really all that much. Take a look at 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The fifth one over is 12 foot. Look how much difference there is between just 12 foot and a 6 foot man. And there are recordings in the book of Enoch and several others of some of the giants being 36 foot. Now, think about that. 36 foot compared to 6 foot. That's one end to the other. Why is this such a big deal in the Bible? Why is this such a big deal in the book of Enoch? Because, trust me, if you were living back in that time, and you run across some of those people, it, it'll be a big deal. Okay, next. Uh, this is just one of the rooms in, in one of the uh, outside temples next. And uh, there is just, there's no way normal people with normal flint. They said that the only thing they had to cut these stones with in the quarry was flint stones. And when they said that, I thought, flint stones, cut with flint stones. You got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. No way. Okay, next. And this is just some more. Uh, next. This is more of the hypergym. This is more of the, the underground palace. You see how those places look like they're supports? They carved them that way. They're not supports. They, that's just design. That's just, they just thought that'll look kind of cool, make it look like there's a beam up there. It's a, it's, it's a faux beam. <laughs> you know, it's not real. And see that little stone down below? See that round stone? They had a whole bunch of those on the outside of the wall. And, and the guy from, uh, from the United Nations, UNESCO, whatever it was, he, he, says, uh, he says, well, if those things weren't moved weren't used to roll those stones on, what else would they use them for? And I said, well, where did you find most of them? Around the edges of the walls. And to me, it just looked like if, if you were some big dude and your hands were about like this, that would just be stones you'd be throwing at the enemy coming at you. Or hold it in your hand and use it as a weapon. Now think about this. The Bible says Goliath had a spear. And if you translate it into pounds, the point on the spear weighed about 20-some pounds. I think 25, is maybe that's what it is, 25. A, bowling, a men's bowling ball is 16 pounds. Just imagine something 10 pounds bigger than a bowling, heavier than a bowling ball on the end of a spear, and they just pick it up and carry it around. Hello? You're not a little guy or just a big person to have that kind of a spear. Let's get real. Okay, next. This is more of the, the temple areas. Next. Uh, there are some uh, museum bones. These are kind of rare. We went to several museums. We went to the curator of the museum. In uh, 1951, they had... Uh, now, keep in mind... 30,000 skeletons in the hypergeum. They have on display in the, in the museum at the hypergeum under low light. And you can only go in the hypergeum, you have to get appointments, only 10 people allowed at a, at a time per hour under strict supervision. To go into that underground place, you have to empty all your pockets, you cannot take a cell phone, you cannot take a ballpoint pen, you have to leave your keys, everything. You cannot take anything in your pockets. Nothing. I mean, they were just about that close to a strip search. It was a big deal. But they had, out of 30,000 skulls, they only display one. Back in 1951, they had, and I saw a picture of it, 
they had several of these skulls on display. These skulls are about this long. Now, granted, some of the ancient cultures, even Egyptian cultures, they would take a, a baby and they would put a board on the head and they would kind of try to, um, I, I forget the term, but they would manually flatten their skull to make them look like, I don't know what, maybe some alien that they had seen. I don't know what, but they, for some reason they wanted to flatten their skull. Well, these elongated skulls were not boarded they were natural that way, and where, and I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, I may have a PhD and stayed at a Holiday Inn, but I'm not an MD. So, but a human skull has, it comes together. You know, when you're, when you're born, your skull is not connected, and it, that's why babies have soft spots, it, and it grows together. And there's a certain seam goes a certain way on a human skull. On these elongated skull, the seams, the ones they found in Peru, the seams went the opposite direction. They were, they were completely different than anything uh, human. And uh, so we were going to, part of our thing was, is the guy who wrote the book on the DNA of these skulls in, in uh, Peru that was on the History Channel, was with us. It was L.A. Marzulli. And we were going to see from the curator of the museum if we could get some DNA off of those skulls. The reality is they won't show them to you. In 1951, the museum placed them someplace, and they're not really sure where. So out of 30,000 skulls, they have one on display, low light. You could not even get to the place where you could look up under it to see how it was connected. Okay, next slide. That's more of the hypergeum. That's another room. It's interesting. A man's voice will do this. A woman's voice will not. I hadn't told Loretta about this yet, but a man can go into that room and you can stand in a certain spot and you can talk like this and you can hear it throughout the entire thing. A woman's voice will not do it. A woman's voice will not leave that room. A man's voice, a certain thing about a man's voice, will resonate through the entire underground palace. Uh, Hypergeum, I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's connected with... Uh, uh, I don't know. I'll look it up. But that's what they call it, hypergeum. I, I think, now I may be wrong, but I think it's connected to a Greek word that means underground. I think. It just, it's a Greek word that means underground, but we can look that up. Uh, you're married to a guy who's a researcher. You know, he'll, he'll look it up for you. It means underground chamber. It means underground chamber. My research associate just looked it up for me. Okay, thank you. Did you just look that up? Okay. Okay, next. Um, this is more of the temple, and I think that's Marzulli off in the distance. Next. Uh, just kind of wanted to give you an idea of where we were. Um, Shannon, would you run up there and get me that pointer? It's back behind the, the chair. I think I saw it the other day. Well, I'm going to have to come up there to point. <laughs> I could have gotten it. Don't you enjoy having Shannon on the worship team now? Yeah, that stick, just that long stick. Yeah, the, that one. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. If you, young lady. All right. Uh, there is Malta. It's a country the size of Camden County. It's a European Union if you drive all the way to Versailles, you're in the ocean. <laughs> okay. So you can see here's Libya, Italy, Greece. Right here is Israel. They believe that the giants on Malta walked, walked over to Gaza and settled here. And that's Gaza in Gaza, you hear about Gaza on the news? In Gaza, and Loretta was at the place, the exact place, is where uh, Goliath 
and David had their battle. Hmm? The Valley of Elah? Elah. Elah. I like that. Okay, so that's the Mediterranean. Next. Oh, oh I'm, I'm getting to that. Next. There's, there's, see that elongated skull? Okay. Next. Okay. This is underwater in the Mediterranean. There was a National Geographic special on this just not too long ago, and they have discovered, uh, I believe it's 16 cities underwater in the Mediterranean, and I have taken some of these pictures of these underwater cities and looked real close, and they got the, some of them have the same markings on them that they have on the island of Malta. Isn't that interesting? Next, it looks like a video game, doesn't it? Okay, next. Oh, this is, oh, see? Oh, go, go back to the next one here. One more. No, go, go forward. Yeah, right there. They found all kinds of uh, statues and, and uh, monoliths and everything, and they pulled some of them out. You can see right there, they're trying to, taking some of this stuff out. Next. That's Egyptian, by the way. They've even found mosaics. I had a guy say to me, well, you know, rocks on the bottom of the ocean could just be look like stairs or something. Well, hello, rocks don't form a mosaic on the bottom of the... <laughs> oh, look, there's a mosaic. It just happened. That's about as dumb as saying we evolved. <laughs> you know, a bunch of metal fell out of the sky. It bounced on the ground and became a 747. Okay. Next, next, you can just see, see the, si see the size of these steps to a person. Now, now, let's get real. If you're a normal person, would you make a step that you have to get a ladder to climb up? I mean, real. Okay, next. Is that the last one, Angie? Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, I didn't mean to kind of keep you this long tonight, but all I want to do tonight is, is let you know that the Bible is a real book about real things. And when you read stuff in the Bible, and you may read and it says, and giants were on the earth in those days, if it says there were giants on the earth, yeah, that's, uh, now that's on uh, Gozo, I believe. Okay. Are there any others, Angie? I think that's basically about all. I just, I tried to not get too many selfies in there. But, see, for years, I remember when Loretta and I were first married, I remember hearing a minister talk, and he'd said, he said, it would really be great if there was some archaeological evidence that there actually was a King David there actually was a Solomon. Because, honestly, they didn't feel they had any. And it hasn't been but just in the last few years, and I think you've seen them. And Loretta's been over there several times. The city of David. I mean, King David's palace, they're, they're uncovering it now. And, and we were over there a few years ago, and they were just starting to uncover it. And every time we've been back, it's like, wow. You know? And the guy's up there saying, well, he probably stood over there and Bathsheba was taking her bath over here. <laughs> like, which you do know, that's why they called her Bathsheba. At any rate, for those of you who don't have the book, the ancient civilizations, we talk about that, and gives a lot of scripture references uh, in here. Uh, everything that we talked about, Lucifer being cast out and all of that stuff, that's all in the Bible. That's not stuff coming out of the book of Enoch and, or Jasher or some of these others, which are referenced in the Bible. You also need to be careful on the book of Enoch. There are, I just want to give you this. There are several versions of the book of Enoch, and some have been altered and some have not. You need to make sure that uh, probably the one by Ken Johnson has been verified through the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think we have 
that one now. It just actually the publication of it just came out a few months ago. And uh, at any rate, was this any of this interesting to anybody? I mean, it's just I know that this wasn't like a normal, but oh, see, and as it was, all that happened in the days of Noah. See, and here we are, Jesus is getting ready to come back. And it says, as it was in the days of Noah. Well, what was happening in the days of Noah? They were killing all the babies. They were messing with the genetics. I mean, look, it's as it was in the days of Noah. And th now, now follow me on this, you know, little kids, put your hands over yours. Perverted sex. Sexual sins. What took place between the fallen angels and earth women was sexual sin. So, what's happening in these last days? What was being accepted at the time of Noah is being accepted at the time of the return. Oh yeah! I mean, I forget which state it was, but I was reading the other day, there's a state that's putting together a handbook, and I forget what, 30 or 35 choices of what gender you are. 76? Well, she's younger than me, so she knows more. But... So you're a psychology major. 76 genders. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Yeah. They, they've been able to uh, transplant parts. Of course, my dad died with a pig valve in his heart. He lived a long time with it, but I mean, you know what I mean. That was supposed to be funny. But, uh, so, I'm just going to dismiss you. Unless, is there anybody here not saved? <laughs> Trust me, you want to get saved. And it, once again, we have in, in the bookstore... Ryan Peterson, who is a, an attorney, has studied, and he, I don't agree totally with everything, but there's a book called um, The Nephilim. It just came out about two or three months ago. It's about 500 pages. We have it in our bookstore. It's, uh, it was the number one selling book on Amazon for about two weeks. And Prophecy Watchers, they broke all records the first day they put it out. It sold 500 books the first day. So... At any rate, we have that in the bookstore. And, uh, but make sure that what you read lines up with the Bible. There's, there's a lot of stuff. He's my friend and he knows it. So I don't, if this goes out, it doesn't really matter. But L.A. Marzulli is my buddy. But I don't agree with everything he says. And he probably doesn't agree with it. But what we've got to do is we've got to agree with this. This is non-negotiable. This is negotiable. This is not negotiable. All right, you're dismissed. Go home. Have fun.